Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, second webinar of the 2021 Jawa Cup webinar series. Um, today's webinar is dedicated to the uh, to all speed preparedness and response, and the total duration will be about one hour. So while all participants are uh, joining, uh, let me provide you with some technical details uh, regarding this webinar. Uh, first of all, the chat. So you can access a chat box uh, where you can ask questions that we'll try to, to answer at, by the end of the, the webinar during a dedicated Q&A session. Um, you also have the possibility to download uh, presentations and, and documents that would be made available uh, at the end of each presentation. It's uh, above uh, the section where you can type your message in the chat. If you have um, any technical issues, for example, connection, internet problems, uh, you can reconnect by clicking on the red button on the top of your screen. And finally, all webinars uh, organized by GRWACAF are available in replay on our website. Um, now, let me quickly introduce myself and the team. So my name is Chloe Gondo. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, facilitating this webinar today. Um, I am Jawakaf project coordinator, and I have with me um, today Stéphane Grenon, who is uh, managing director at Tribes Environmental Emergencies, and he will uh, give two presentations today. Hi, Stéphane. Hello. Um, we also have my colleague, Emily Canova, who is Jawakaf project manager. Uh, she's in the control room right now, and she's here to flag your, your questions and uh, help you with uh, any potential technical issues you may have. Um, so let me start with a quick presentation on uh, Jawakaf, uh, the Jawakaf project. So after a first series of uh, webinars organized uh, last year, on the main principles and general framework of all spill preparedness and response, of which you can find all the videos in, in replay on our website. Um, this second series will focus on slightly more specific and technical subjects. For the, those of you who did not attend uh, the first webinar series and uh, may not be uh, very familiar with the GIAWACAF, I uh, will give you a very brief introduction to the, to the project before introducing the, the webinar. Um, so uh, the Jawakaf project, sorry, was launched in uh, 2006 in the framework of the Global Initiative. Uh, the Global Initiative was a uh, joint uh, endeavor between uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, uh, which is the United Nations Specialized Agency responsible for navigation safety and the protection of the marine environment, and IPICA, uh, which is the Oil and Gas Industry Association for Improving Social and uh, Environmental Performance. The, the, the aim of the GIAWACAF project is really to promote cooperation between governments and industry in the spirit of the OPRC uh, 90 Convention, which stands for the International Convention on All uh, Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation. Uh, it is really a convention that is key for all spill preparedness and response. And you might have heard of it already if you had indeed webinars two and three last year. Um, the objective of the of the GIAWACAF project is to enhance the capacity of 22 partners countries in Africa, which you can see on the on the, the map um, on the screen, um, for for these countries to prepare for and respond to all spills, uh, so that they can better protect their marine and coastal environment and communities. Um, to do so, we organized several types of uh, activities, namely uh, national or sub-regional workshops, trainings, uh, exercises, uh, biennial conferences, and also technical assistance activities. Um, 
Here you can see in a nutshell what GeoACAF uh, does and how it works. Um, reading clockwise and, and starting from, from the top in the, in the green box. Uh, the GeoACAF project is a joint endeavor of the public and private sectors to manage all, all spill risk and mitigate associated impacts. Um, it supports 22 African partners countries in the development and implementation of sub-regional and national hospital preparedness and response systems. It does maintain a constant liaison with partners, uh, partner countries and the industry to provide tailored capacity building solutions. Uh, we organize, uh, as I said before, workshops, training courses and exercises. We do encourage better communication and collaboration between governments and industry. We and also encourage partner countries to ratify and implement international conventions from IMO and other UN bodies. And as I said before, we also work in the spirit of the OPRC 90 convention. So um, building on the first season, which ran from June to December 2020, and covered the main principles and general framework of all speed preparedness and response from different perspectives, uh, namely technical, legal, institutional aspects. Um, this new uh, series of webinar will cover more specific topics related to all speed preparedness and response. Um, today's webinar is the second episode of uh, 2021. Uh, series and is dedicated to uh, waste management in case of an oil spill. Um, the objectives of today's webinar are for you to get an overview of the different aspects and phases of waste management following a marine oil spill. Um, it's also for you to understand the interdependence between cleanup strategies and waste mini minimization and management. Uh, and for you to understand the importance of uh, for decision makers and uh, operational responders to plan in the early stages to control and manage uh, waste during and after shoreline cleanup operations. And finally, it's also important for you to understand the importance to have waste management policy and strategy in place beforehand, uh, as it is a vital component of uh, any all spill contingency plan. Um, to do so, I have with me today Stéphane Grenon. Uh, as I said, he's the managing director of uh, Triox uh, Environmental Energies, um, Emergencies, I'm sorry. Um, he will deliver two 15-minute uh, presentations, uh, followed by uh, quick quizzes. And uh, at the end of the webinar, he will answer your questions during uh, uh, a Q&A uh, a dedicated to Q&A session. So the first uh, presentation of Sefan uh, will address the general principles and different types of waste. And the second presentation will address the different phases of the cycle of waste management and the importance of planning and inclusion in the national spill contingency plan. Um, for that, you can find the webinars program in the documents to be downloaded near the, the chat box. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you can find more information about DIYCAF and our activities in the brochure that is available uh, for download above the chat box uh, or also on our LinkedIn page on or in our website, jawacaf.net. Um, now I'll we'll give the floor to Stéphane Grenot for his, for his first presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Chloe said, my name is uh, Stéphane Granon uh, with uh, Triox Environmental Emergencies. I'm very pleased to uh, be with you this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and uh, to discuss with you a uh, quite an important topic in our still response, which is uh, often overlooked when we do preparedness work, uh, which is uh, waste management. Uh, as Chloe mentioned, we'll be uh, doing two uh, short presentations of 15 minutes today. Uh, so you understand that we will give you a, a very high level overview of some uh, general principle and as well as the waste management uh, cycle. Uh, 
but I hope to share with you some of the key aspects of waste, man waste, uh, waste management that can help you if uh, you have to face uh, a spill, which I hope you will not uh, need to, to implement. Uh, just a few words about uh, Triox Environmental Emergency. I mean, we're we're a consulting firm uh, working with all aspects of emergency uh, preparedness, training, and response for oil and chemical spills. Um, you have our web page and our LinkedIn page there if you want to learn more. As for myself, uh, I've been working in this field for about 25 years now, uh, working on uh, responses and many preparedness projects. Uh, and uh, you have my email at the bottom there. If you have any questions or you want to lo learn more about Triox, you can uh, send me an email. I'll be very happy to uh, reply uh, to you. Okay, so the main uh, topic now, um, as we indicated, waste management is, is a very important topic for oil spill response. Uh, for those of you that have been involved in the response, uh, it is quite a big challenge. Uh, it's not something that uh, easily implemented. Uh, and as everything we do in oil spill uh, response, if you're not prepared in advance, it will be very difficult and your life uh, might be a bit complicated at the time of a spill. So it's something you need to really look at and prepare in advance and make sure you have uh, what is necessary to implement an efficient uh, waste management uh, program. Uh, some of the challenge we face, I mean, you can see on this picture there, uh, you know, we already, we have uh, different waste types. Uh, there'll be many different uh, waste types during an oil spill response. Uh, the picture you can see, you have uh, floating oil, which is like rainbow sheet, and then you have um, absorbent material that the uh, responders have uh, used. They were using quite a lot of, uh, of uh, absorbent. All of this material will, will become a waste. Uh, and also you can see that the workers, they're wearing PPE, uh, protection equipment. So this will be contaminated, uh, will become a waste as well. And this is just from one situation. So you can imagine on a larger scale incident uh, with shoreline cleanup and so on. The, the volume and the type of waste will be uh, quite significant. And uh, you will need to deal with all of these different types of waste. And sometimes it will be in uh, different manners. So uh, you, you need to think about that in advance. Uh, the volume of waste uh, can be uh, much larger than the original spill. That's not uncommon. Uh, of course, there's different factors there. The uh, oil type will have an influence, the location of the spill, the types of sediments and things like that. But as a general rule, you can expect to have more uh, waste than uh, oil that was spilled in the environment. And again, on the picture there, you can see uh, again on the water, we have a sheen of oil, uh, like a rainbow color, which is uh, pretty much like a small amount of oil. But when we look at the potential waste, like I was pointing out, the absorbance there, uh, the volume of abs potential absorbents that we need to be recovered and, and disposed of is m probably much larger than the quantity of oil we have on the water. So uh, again, expect on a larger scale incident, uh, the volume of waste could be very, very significant. And uh, if you're not prepared, you can have to, uh, you might have to deal with uh, these, these waste for a long time as well. Uh, you will see in the next few slides that uh, waste management require a logistical operation and sometimes it could be quite complex. Uh, you know, uh, you need uh, containers to put the waste in, you need different types of containers, you will need to move those containers to uh, disposal sites, you will need human resources to deal with that, uh, different equipment. So it can be very um, complicated, but uh, it's, it's quite uh, logistical intensive operation. Uh, waste management, uh, the whole process uh, could be quite expensive. So that's something you don't want to neglect in your preparedness. And of course, uh, as with everything else we do, we have uh, national and international regulations that are in place uh, that we must uh, follow in our waste management plan. And uh, these will have impacts on what we're able to do and how we are able to do it. So really just from this uh, short list of uh, there's other challenges with waste management, but just with this uh, short list, you can see that 
if we're not looking at all these aspects before a spill happened, uh, we we're, we might have a bit of a problem there and things will be complicated. If there's a one key message today that you have to remember, it's it's this one really like waste management. Sometimes people are very preoccupied and they move in and they respond and they deploy equipment, they recover oil, and then they think about waste management uh, later in the response. Well, you need to uh, include waste management and think about it right at the beginning of an incident, because if you have any problems with your waste management cycle, uh, you might have to uh, stop the response to re stop recovering oil at sea or on the shoreline because you're not going to have anywhere to put that oil and associated waste that you are recovering. So waste management should be at the forefront of your uh, planning and at the forefront of your decision making at the time of a response. Uh, otherwise, uh, you might, uh, you will probably certainly have a significant issue and you might have to slow down recovery or stop uh, altogether. As I said, uh, very important to consider waste management uh, throughout the response. Uh, this is something that needs to be integrated in your incident management structure, whatever you are using, if you are using ICS or any other uh, management structure, in your uh, country or organization, uh, you must have a team that will be dedicated to work on uh, waste management, to coordinate the uh, all operations, to look at the getting permits, uh, making sure that everything is working. So you need a team that will work specifically on, on waste management issues. And uh, one of the key points as well is that the cleanup choices that we will make uh, at the time of a response. Um, sometimes people are very, uh, they're in a rush to respond they, they, and they forget to think about the ways that are generated by the different techniques and strategies that we can use uh, during oil spill uh, response. Uh, I'll give you some example later, but the choice of cleanup is, is really a key aspect. Uh, that you need to consider. So if we start looking at a bit more details about waste management, some of the key uh, factors, obviously the first one, the type of waste, um, like I mentioned, depending on uh, where you are, when the spill happened and the, the environment that you are operating in, uh, you, you will have different you know, vegetation or different shoreline types of, or, or equipment that will be in contact with oil and these will become waste. So these are just a list of, of uh, what we usually see in oil spill response. Obviously, we have the oil itself. If we do um, recovery at sea, for example, oil and water mixture, you know, we never recover 100% oil. There's always a bit of water in there. We can have emulsified oil. Uh, and sometimes we, uh, we, we focus on the oil, but we will have other uh, dirty waters like gray water uh, that will come from uh, decontamination activities, uh, from uh, toilets that are on sites and things, and, and you need to consider those as well. And it's kind of the same thing for solid, uh, you know, uh, where we will have uh, sediment in contact with oil, uh, debris, uh, wildlife and, and, and cleaning material. And also domestic waste. I mean, we don't want to forget those as well. You will have people working. They will uh, have lunches and things like that, food wrap, uh, all kinds of material that they, they will use will create another type of waste that you need to, to consider. Uh, the next slide is just some example of these. Uh, the first picture on the top left, uh, there was a spill in a small fishing harbor in, in Lebanon. Uh, you can see there lots of oil, black oil, so a good thickness of oil. Uh, you can expect to have lots of liquid oil recover, depending on if you're using skimmer uh, or other things. But you can see as well that there's a lot of floating debris around, and these will be uh, will need to be recovered. So you will have liquid and solid waste at the same time, and the boom itself is pretty much damaged, and it's probably unlikely that you will be able to clean it. So that this will become a waste as well. So a mixture of solid and liquid waste in that case. When you look on the picture, the top right picture, uh, that's a spill in Norway. You can see uh, oil on the water surface with the boom deployed, but recover um, oil and water in that case, not so much debris as it's pretty a clean uh, environment. 
And then the bottom, we have shoreline contamination, so emulsified oil on a sandy beach. Uh, so you can see you have oil and oily uh, sand. And the other one, we have pretty much liquid pool oil coming from the shoreline. So you can expect liquid, maybe a mix of debris in there, vegetation and other things like that. And of course, uh, PPE from the, the worker. So different scenarios, different type of waste. One of the type of waste that uh, can be quite significant as well is all the response uh, equipment, uh, absorbent booms, uh, and so on, and PPE. So the top left is more like absorbent, uh, and the bottom right is more PPE used by worker, and so on. So Tyvek suits, gloves, boots, uh, whatever, uh, will generate waste. Uh, as well as wildlife, if unfortunately there is some wildlife contaminated, these will uh, become a waste as well. So they might be considered, depending on regulation, or they can, might be considered a bio waste that will need a specific uh, disposal process. And of course, shoreline cleanup where we have vegetation and oil and so on. Uh, two key principles that you need to consider when you do waste management, and these are, are pretty uh, important. The first one is we need to try to minimize the generation of waste as much as possible uh, during all activities that we will undertake uh, at sea, uh, shoreline response, and, and every other operation. And you have to remember that everything will, that will touch oil will become a hazardous waste in most location in the world uh, per regulation. So even one drop of oil, it's a, it's a hazardous waste and it needs to be disposed in a proper manner. The other one is you need to segregate your waste. Uh, we've seen different types of waste. Uh, your uh, waste recovery operation needs to separate all the waste as this will be, uh, this will facilitate the final disposal or reuse of the waste. So that's something that must be implemented right at the beginning and yeah, that you uh, must be ready for. And I'll give you some example of these two principles, uh, what these can look in real life. Uh, a bit of a tip, uh, that's a typical beach in many places in the world. Unfortunately, you see lots of debris, uh, all kinds of uh, plastic, metal, uh, and so on. Uh, one really good practice to implement, if you know that oil is moving into that direction, for example, it's to send crews to clean up the beach, uh, remove all the debris. And in this way, you uh, not only you will facilitate your oil recovery operation, but you will also minimize the amount of waste you will need to deal with. So we see it's a sandy beach. If we have oil on the beach, that's a pretty good situation that we can deal with. We have techniques for that and it's pretty straightforward. If we have oil mixed with plastic bottles and so on, it's a bit more complicated and requires more logistical uh, support and things like that. So we remove everything that might be on the beach, pirogues, uh, you know, if we have restaurants, tables and chairs and all that stuff, uh, try to remove whatever's on the beach before to minimize contact with the oil and minimize the amount of waste. Another practice is to select the um, cleanup techniques. Uh, we want to select the techniques that will generate less waste as much as possible, depending on what you have and the circumstances of the, of the spill. But here's a, a, a simple example. Uh, on the left side, we have a drum skimmer, which is specifically designed to collect the layer of oil that is floating on top of the water. Uh, it's always collecting a bit of water, but this one is designed specifically to focus on the oil. So in a setup like that, where we have quite a, a good amount of oil floating on the surface, uh, we can be pretty confident that we will uh, recover a lot of oil and a bit of water. Um, so this will minimize the volume of uh, oily water we have to deal with. And when we look on the uh, right side, uh, the picture there, we have someone operating a vacuum system. Uh, we can see on the picture, not much oil, but I don't know if you see well on your screen, but uh, you would see that the, uh, the person is actually recovering a lot of water and a little bit of oil. So this will generate significant volumes of uh, clean water mixed with a bit of oil and becomes a waste that we have to, to deal with and can generate quite a large volume if, uh, if again, this will be done on a larger scale. That was a, a bit at sea, but if we're doing a shoreline cleanup, um, the same thing, the easy example is manual recovery where we're uh, 
our workers are able to recover the the layer of sediments that, that are contaminated with oil and leaving whatever is clean under on site. And uh, this, this, I mean, humans are pretty good at this. And if we're using uh, heavy machinery uh, for mechanical recovery, yes, it's going to be quicker. Uh, but at the same time, you will recover a larger amount of uh, clean sand and again, increasing your volume of waste. So when you make the decision on the strategies you want to use, you have to keep that in mind and try to select uh, the things that will uh, minimize the, uh, the volume of waste you will have. Uh, some uh, important factors for this, obviously, uh, people need to be trained and your responder need to be aware that the waste uh, might be a problem, so they need to minimize as much as possible. Uh, selection of cleanup techniques and strategies, I mean, there there is quite a bit of guidance on that. Uh, that's one example that you have there on the table. Uh, that's from the uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, the most recent SCAP manual. But you see the last column is talking about waste volume that you can expect from specific response uh, technique. So it gives you an indication so you can do a, uh, a good selection. And also careful with absorbent and PPE. I mean, sometimes uh, we see a lot of response where people are, are using too many sorbents. Uh, and it's it's difficult to uh, to get rid of these after in in, in the waste chain. Uh, segregation that's the uh, other key principle that that you you need to follow. Really, it's basically you need to create to have specific containers for each waste type as much as possible, uh, as these might be uh, disposed in different manners. Here you have an example of uh, on the right side. I mean, you have dirty vegetation. You don't see very well, but it's vegetation that was collected as a spill in the Bahamas, but uh, vegetation. And then the next uh, waste cell is like oily rocks. So everything is segregated and then they can be treated accordingly. Uh, and on the left side, I mean, a smaller setup, but still you have containers that are properly marked and are used for very specific purposes and waste type. So you need to implement that as much as possible so your waste are, are separated and then the, the disposal will be much easier. What we really don't want to see is this, you know, where you have liquid, solid, plastic, metal, everything is mixed together. And this, this uh, can be uh, quite a significant problem. That was from the Erica in, in France in 1999. And they had uh, to deal with waste for a long, long time. They even have to, they had to build a special facility to deal with the waste and segregation was one of the problems. So really, really important principle to uh, make your life easier. Uh, and finally, uh, legislation. Uh, obviously, that's uh, something that's important uh, depending on the country where you operate or the region. Uh, the, the, I mean, it's everywhere. The, there are uh, regulation that you must uh, follow. Uh, these will deal with different aspects of waste management, like storage, transportation, I mean, uh, location of uh, storage site, for example. And in many cases, you need permits or authorization from the government and, and so on. So you really need to look at that in advance. I mean, what are the permits you need to apply? How long it will take to get the permits? What do you need to, uh, to um, provide in terms of information to get the permits? So all of this should be look, looked at before. And obviously at the international level, there's a, a number of uh, convention in place to deal with the movement of waste. I mean, the Basel Convention is a, is a, a key one uh, where state must be, must notify uh, receiving state, exporting state must uh, notify the receiving state um, for the waste. So that's generate paperwork generally, and you need to do the paperwork and proper marking on your waste and segregation and proper containers and things like that. So you need to be aware of all these aspects uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with waste. On this, uh, we're good for the quiz, uh, Chloe. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so can you go to your... Okay, um, here's a little quiz for you. Um, so the question is the following. What is your biggest challenge for the implementation of these key principles, minimization and segregation? 
Uh, possible answer one is training, possible answer two is equipment, possible answer three is planning, possible answer four is legislation. You can access this uh, poll, by, uh, which should appear uh, under the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. There is a poll tab. You need to uh, unfold, uh, unfold up by clicking on the smaller row. So I'll give you a bit of uh, time to uh, answer the quiz. Um, Stefan, can you see uh, the first results? Uh, no. Oh, sorry, it's it's coming. All right, so once again, the question is, what is your biggest challenge for the implementation of these key principles, minimization and segregation? Possible answer one is training or equipment or planning or legislation. And uh, as a reminder, you can answer the poll, uh, which will appear under the chat uh, box at the bottom right of your screen. There is a little poll tab that you need to unfold up by clicking on the small arrow. All right, so it's, it doesn't seem to be working right now because I see uh, answers in the in, in the chat, but not in the in the in the poll. Um, Stefan, do you can you go to the chat? Uh, yes, uh, it's difficult because I see. Well, I see planning. I see legislation. Planning, training, legislation. Yeah, I mean, all, all of these uh, elements. Uh, I don't see uh, you know, how many people are answering, but but there are certain certainly uh, key factors for for implementing a proper waste management. Uh, often. Uh, people are, the training aspect is really important. Uh, many of the uh, people responsible for operation, uh, for oil recovery operation and things like that are, are, are sometimes not aware of the uh, importance of trying to minimize and to segregate as much as possible. So it's, a, it's kind of a, you know, depending on where you are, but the, these are, are, are key aspects, uh, definitely. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Now, now it's working. So let's move on to the second quiz. Um, okay, so you have a situation here. So what is your advice? Uh, answer A, either you remove everything from the shore and store it in a single container, or answer B, you collect all debris and try to separate material into categories such as oily wood, vegetation, other oily material, non-old material. Okay, I can see that um, most of you can access the, the yeah. poll right now, so I'll give you a bit of time. So it looks like the question is uh, obvious for everybody. Yeah, uh, this is a... So typical shoreline that we see in uh, many places around the world. That's a picture from uh, Ivory Coast. So you see you have a stretch uh, where you have all the debris under that. There's a sandy uh, sandbar. I mean, it's a sandbar. And we're in the middle of a mangrove area. So that's that's very common. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, as much as possible, we are going to try to uh, to instruct our recovery team to uh, segregate the waste, you know, oily wood can be treated in a different way than uh, plastic material, for example, or from sediment. And somewhere in there, we we have we also have clean materials, so these need to be separated uh, to make sure we don't we don't have a, a larger volume uh, than necessary for hazardous waste or oily waste. Uh, as it would be a different disposal option. So sometimes it's not easy. It's not always uh, easy, when, especially like when you have a, a situation like this where there's a bit of everything and obviously uh, your operation will take a bit more time because it's more like a manual recovery type uh, 
project and then having mechanical or, or something else that could help. But it, it's necessary to uh, to minimize the, the, the problems you will have uh, at the end of the response with the long-term storage of waste and, and disposal. Thank you, Stefan. I need the poll now and we had uh, six Six percent response for question uh, answer A and uh, ninety-three percent for answer B. Um, okay, I'll, Stefan, I'll let you continue with your uh, presentation number two. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So next presentation. Okay, so have you seen the part one? I mean, just uh, like I said, it's it's a kind of a quick overview of uh, key principles. Uh, now we will be looking a bit more at the, the waste management cycle, the, the planning that's involved, and then uh, we'll discuss uh, quite a bit about having a waste management plan and what should be in there and how we can we can do this. And then we'll discuss question at the end. So a waste management plan. I mean, uh, I mean, you've seen. I hope in the first presentation that uh, there's many different factors and aspects to consider. And if you're going into a spill response without any waste management plan that you worked on before uh, the incident, it will be quite challenging because for everything that I've shown you, all the waste type uh, we need to, for example, you need to evaluate, you need to identify the type of uh, containers you will use. Are you going to use bags or drums or you going to use a, a tank from a vessel and things like that? And then you need to decide where you're going to store these uh, these waste. How are you going to move them from one place to another? Where are you going to take them to, to dispose and so on? So if you don't have a plan before uh, the incident, it will be uh, quite challenging to do all that work uh, under pressure during an emergency. Okay, so really, if you want to be successful, and, and as I said, uh, the uh, waste management plan, it's not something separate from your response. It's a, a part, a key part of your response. And it might, I mean, if, you're, if your waste management plan is not working, if you have issues, it might slow down the response, the oil recovery operation, or you might have to stop because you're not going to have any where to put the waste. So that's, uh, that's quite critical to do. Uh, the waste management plan, some key elements that uh, we typically find in the waste management plan, uh, obviously regulation, uh, you need to look at what are the regulation in force in your area for the, your country, uh, what, what is applicable to your organization, and also the national oil spill uh, contingency plan or your facility plan, uh, whatever you are uh, operating from. Uh, you need to make sure that you follow the regulation and you make, need to make sure that your waste management plan uh, also follows what uh, is uh, identified in your national plan. Okay, so there's definitely a link there and that's the starting point. You need to look at which uh, regulatory environment you are working under and also um, which uh, international convention as well that your country has ratified that might have an impact. Then uh, we look at potential volumes. Uh, you know, we need to have an idea of what kind of waste, the different types, and how much of these wastes we might have to recover. And to do that, really, we use uh, scenarios. So spill scenario. Uh, Sometimes, you know, people are, are, there's a different way of looking at this. Sometimes people work with the worst case scenario. So to have the larger potential volume, sometimes people work with the most, uh, probable scenario, but uh, anyhow, you need to have scenarios and, and start thinking about how much waste you might have to deal with uh, in a given situation that is uh, in line with your operation or facilities. Obviously, when it's a country, it's a different uh, volume, but uh, you need to look at that. Then you have to look at the, the resources you might need, uh, what's what you think you might need and what's available. And it's very important to know what might be missing. Um, so in there, you know, container types, uh, human resources, how many workers, uh, trucks, uh, available companies for transportation, things like that. So you need to look at all of that. Um, the other uh, on the uh, bottom uh, row there, the, the first one on the left, uh, 
identify the potential uh, storage site, temporary storage site and transportation method. This is really a key element. Uh, I'll show you the next slide, we, we'll, we'll talk about that, but you will recover mat material uh, during your response operation, uh, either from uh, response at sea or on the shoreline. Uh, you will need to store this material uh, before you can dispose of it. So you, you will have a location near the working sites where you will need to store uh, waste and then you will need to move them to, if you're lucky, you can go straight from the shore to the uh, final disposal site or you will have intermediary uh, storage that will need to be implemented, but I'll come back on that. But you need to work on that. So where uh, can you uh, establish those, uh, those storage sites? Uh, during a response is really a key element and try to get the permission and so on uh, before N is also a, a key thing. Uh, final disposal, uh, what are your options in the country where you operate? Uh, are you going to be able to deal with all the waste type or for some types you will need to export them to another country and things like that? So you need to work on that. And cost, how much is going to cost you to deal, to implement your waste management plan, what type of uh, financial resources uh, you will need. I'm not gonna go into the details of this one, but this is pretty much a step-by-step a, a -step, uh, waste management development uh, program that you could follow. Uh, the first step is really to put a team together, look at the legislation, uh, you know, and, and look at existing plan that might be uh, available in country or for your facility, so collecting information. Then the second step is really drafting a, a waste management plan, which will be kind of a generic plan at this point. You know, you need to look at container facilities, uh, storage facilities, uh, all the health and safety reporting and tracking is a very important aspect of waste. You need to be able to track all the shipment of waste and where where they're going, where how much there is and so on. So really like in step two, you're building your plan, uh, your waste management plan. Then step three, you have a plan, but now you need to train people, you need to execute the plan, you need to uh, maintain it. So training is a big component uh, for a waste management plan. Uh, you need to train your responders so they are aware, they, they know what to do. And uh, really one of the best thing to do as well is to do exercises where you will exercise the uh, waste management function and you will learn and then you can implement corrections to your plan, make changes, uh, making sure that uh, everything is, is working smoothly. And then if you're unlucky and you have a spill, then you already have your generic a waste management plan that you can take and then you can customize it, you can adapt it to the situation you are facing and this becomes your incident waste management plan. So just to, uh, when, when you already have a, a generic plan that's uh, all developed, it's, it's very easy to use that plan and, and to establish an incident specific plan with all the uh, aspects, the different aspects is already identified and everything is, has been worked out with regulators often in advance. So now it's just implementation and, and following what you have in your plan. Some key elements, uh, as I mentioned, the, the storage component is a key thing. I mean, the yellow circle on the shoreline, you will have recovery sites uh, either at sea uh, or on the shoreline. Uh, and then you will need to store the oil or oily materials that you are recording near the work sites or on the work site. So these are yellow circles. These are where the cleanup operations are taking place. That is where we're, we're doing temporary storage. At some point, this storage will be full. Uh, you will need to empty or move the containers to an intermediate or a longer term storage facility, depending on, on your uh, circumstances. So you will need to move the waste from the temporary storage to, to these new sites. Uh, this is typically uh, remote from the location of the uh, cleanup activities, could be a couple of 100 kilometers, depending on, on, on where you are. So you need to move the waste, so you need to transport so uh, uh, load them up on either a truck, a train, a, a boat, depending on, on the operation, and you need to move them somewhere else. And then 
they will spend a bit of time there, uh, weeks maybe, depending on the, the situation and how your setup is and your waste stream. And then they will be finally disposed. They will be moved to a, a final uh, to a facility for final disposal. Either uh, they will be buried, they will be incinerated, and so on. There's, we'll come back to that. But there's different things. So all of these transport and storage need to be worked out. And this is where the the, the main logistical element of waste management uh, will come into uh, into play because you need containers, you need transportation, and so on. Uh, let's look about. Let's look at these key elements. I mean, uh, in temporary storage, like uh, I said, on on the work site, it's uh, very often a limiting factor because you, you need to be able to put all of the waste that you're recovering. You know, we have very efficient recovery equipment, especially like skimmers. Skimmers are really efficient now. You can recover seventy-five cubic meter of oil and water mixed together in in one hour, depending on the equipment you have, for example. So if you only have 50 cubic meter of storage, uh, you will need to empty that, that storage very rapidly uh, to be able to continue uh, recovery operation. So that's, a, that's where the limiting factor is and that's, that's what you need to uh, consider in advance. So there's different type of storage. Uh, you know, we can have drums, we have bags, uh, we have uh, pits, uh, we have portable tanks that can do the work. And uh, typically what we are looking for in terms of a store, proper storage site, uh, it's somewhere where we, are, we, uh, we have access, where it's a flat surface and that's protected from the environment, like, uh, you know, from the, mainly from the waves and tides. I mean, we don't want it to be too close. And the next tide we have our containers that are, uh, you know, uh, surrounded by water and then they can spill again and so on. And obviously, we'll try to avoid sensitive areas as much as possible. Uh, that's the ideal one. Sometimes it's not always ideal. These are two examples. Uh, one in Lebanon here, you see the temporary storage, the bags, uh, with all the waste that's recovered. The beach is just a few meters uh, in front of that site. Uh, so directly in, on the beach, in the upper part, so everything is protected from waves and tides and waste are left there for, for a while, and then they, they will be collected and transported to intermediate uh, storage. On the right side, we have a pit. This one is pretty close to the water. Uh, that's something to consider, you know, if there's a big wave or something, or if there's a heavy rain, uh, the pit could overflow and things like that, and then the oil goes back in the environment. So you really need to, uh, to pick your sites uh, very well to avoid the, uh, another contamination, you know, once you recover. Uh, at sea, I mean, it could be on vessel tanks. Uh, we have floating tanks as well, different barges uh, for temporary storage. Uh, obviously, these will need to uh, go to a port with reception facility and they will need to be emptied. Uh, Sometimes, like I said, they can be very efficient, recovering a lot of oil and water, but then they have to go back to a port where they're slow or they will need to be offloaded offshore uh, to be able to continue uh, pumping oil at sea. So you need to uh, consider that as well. Uh, once they are in temporary storage, uh, the waste will need to be moved uh, either to another storage facility or to a final disposal. So what we're going to try when we identify the containers uh, where in which we're going to store the waste, we're going to try to have containers that will be easy to move after. Because remember, if they're too big, too heavy, you will need to lift them and load them onto uh, a mean of transportation. It could be a truck or a boat or something. Uh, so you need to think about that. People need to be able to lift and move those, uh, those uh, waste. Uh, and we're going to try to pick a container that uh, can, where we can keep the waste uh, in in that container as long as possible. That we don't need to transfer from one container to the other. It's just uh, making our life a bit more complicated and tracking of waste and marking and following regulation. These are just examples. Uh, obviously, by sea, if you're operating in remote location, maybe the only access is by water, so you need boats to be able to carry waste or trucks here and you see here we need to lift the bags onto the truck for transportation so you need to think about that you know if you don't have a crane available if you don't have uh, the proper truck you need to use other containers 
And in some cases, the only thing we can do is use a helicopter. It's a bit blurry there, but that helicopter is uh, transporting uh, one cubic meter of oil, uh, small boxes, uh, removing them from a ship. And that was the only thing to do at that place. I was in Alaska, a very remote location. So all that need to be included in your, in your plan. Uh, I'll go straight to this thing. Uh, Final disposal and disposal. There's lots of, uh, of possibilities that might be available. I mean, depending on the country where you operate, uh, these might be limited. In other places, all of these techniques uh, might be uh, available. This is a, a, a diagram that's coming from an IPCA guide on waste management. Uh, I can give you the reference after, but uh, there is many ways of uh, disposing of uh, waste, uh, oily waste. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details, but something that is interesting is the column on the left, left the pretreatment. Uh, there is many things we can do to minimize waste, even once they are in uh, storage. Uh, and a good example is decantation, where we will, you know, oil will float on the water. If we recover a lot of oil mixed with water, the oil will float in the container on top of the water in the container, and then we can easily pump the water. Uh, out of the container, which will give us more storage and give us concentrated oil that we can uh, maybe use for incineration in, in some industries or even go back to an oil refinery to uh, to create oil. So all of this is there. And um, that's it. So in conclusion, uh, that's a high level overview, but Waste management, I mean, obviously, if you're not prepared, might have a very severe impact on your response effectiveness. Uh, align your waste management plan with the local regulation and your national oil spill or facility oil spill plan. Uh, include a specific team in waste management, uh, dealing with waste management in your uh, incident management structure. And the key principle, minimize and segregate uh, as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Um, let's have a new quiz. Um, so let me read this, this new question. Uh, does your country or organization have a waste management plan? Yes or no? Uh, please give us a bit of time to launch the, the, the poll. Here it is. Uh, so you can now answer the poll, uh, which will appear under the chat box uh, at the bottom right of your screen. You need to unfold up the, the poll tab by clicking on the small arrow. I can see that uh, most of you are responding. So once again, the question is, does your country or organization have a waste management plan? Yes or no? While the, some of you are still responding, uh, Stefan, do you mind do you mind commenting on this question? Uh, yes, I think that's a, that's a good news. I can see that most people have a, a waste management plan, which is the the good practice to do. Uh, it would be interesting to know if this plan uh, has been exercised and if people are trained. But uh, but that's that's a, a good practice that the. Uh, people that should, that should have and implement in their facility or country. So no, no, that's, that's good. All right, thank you. We'll end this uh, uh, third poll here and uh, we'll move on to the last question, uh, which is a situation. So the question is uh, the following, what's wrong here uh, regarding the, the, the image on the screen? So answer A, it's a wrong uh, container. Answer B, it's too much material in the bags. Answer C, it's no, there's no ground protection. Or answer D, all of the above. So here we go. Uh, you can access the poll now. Okay. Uh, while you are all um, answering, let me remind you that uh, you have the possibility to download Stefan's both presentations in the in the download section uh, near the chat box. Uh, you also have access to different uh, documents, guidance documents that uh, were put together by um, 
uh, CEDRE, uh, which is a French uh, institute, also ITOF, uh, IPK, and POSO, uh, which are all English versions. And uh, you who will have the possibility to uh, view uh, this webinar in replay uh, starting tomorrow on our YouTube channel or on our website. Um, so, Stefan, I think we got the majority of the answers. Uh, yeah. Could you give the, the right answer? Yeah, it's still overwhelming. I mean, it's pretty obvious, this one as well. Uh, it's, it's pretty much all of the above, right? I mean, everything is wrong here. Uh, wrong container. This is just a generic uh, plastic bag uh, for domestic waste. So that's not made to, to, to sustain the weight of oil. Uh, too much material. Some are, are filled with oil. It's difficult to, to uh, move them. And I didn't get into the details on how to set up your waste station. But yeah, typically we put a membrane on the ground to avoid secondary contamination because uh, like we see here that the bags are leaking. Now we have a, a new contaminated site. I mean, we will need to recover that oil and to remove some of the sand and sediment. So yes, uh, all of the above was the good answer and uh, lots of smart people on the online <laughs> here. Or it's Thank you easy. very much, Stefan. Um, okay, let's. Uh, we have a few uh, minutes left in the in this webinar, so let's move on to the Q and A session. Um, I have a few questions for you, Stefan. Uh, let me first close the stop the presentation so that we are both back on the screen. Um, so one question is: uh, How long does it take for the Lyme treatment to be effective? Well, the, the lime treatment uh, is a treatment where you can mix uh, oil or oily material. I mean, it's not going to be used on pure oil. It's usually like a, a oily sand and things like that, uh, where you mix them with uh, calcium carbonate and it will stabilize the oil into the sand matrix. Uh, so you don't have the leaking oil anymore. Uh, usually it's pretty rapid. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, you, you will mix uh, oily sand with, with, uh, with lime and um, it will be, uh, it's, al it's almost an instantaneous uh, reaction. It's a chemical reaction that happened. And, uh, you know, within, I would say, a few hours, uh, the material is stabilized and uh, the oil is not uh, a problem anymore. But the dosage is important in this one and it's... Uh, uh, it's the amount of uh, oil as well that that's important in the sediments. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of other questions. Uh, another one is how can all companies participate in uh, waste, waste management? Well, it, it, oil companies will have, uh, I mean, they will have their plans and usually including in, in their plans, they will have waste management plan and they can provide uh, maybe support to national authorities in terms of uh, technical advice and they can logistical support as well, identifying, you know, there's lots of uh, elements that needs to come together. Like the, you need the container, you need a company to, to move those containers and so on. And that's probably a support that uh, your colleagues from oil companies can provide as well as planning support. But uh, I would encourage you to make, get in touch with uh, the uh, your colleagues from oil companies in, in your country and, and have that discussion, you know, in case of uh, an incident. And so at least you know in advance what uh, what can be expected. Um, all right. Uh, then I have a question that just popped up. Uh, how do you test the, the eff uh, efficiency of a national plan? I believe it's uh, West Management National Plan. Uh, yeah, well, there, there's tools available. I mean, there's two ways of testing your plan. There's, a, there's tools to make sure that guidance, to make sure that all elements of, uh, of your contingency plan or your waste management plan are included in your actual plan to make sure that you, that you have a complete plan and you didn't forget any elements. And then the other way of testing, really the best way is, is to carry out exercises uh, and to test the implementation of that plan. Uh, you know, again, the chain, the waste stream, uh, getting in touch uh, with, with people, finding location and so on to test the different uh, elements you have in your plan and 
once you do an exercise, and it doesn't have to be a large scale, uh, really complicated exercise, you can test different components, right, uh, with small uh, exercises. But you will learn a lot and you'll know what, what's working and uh, what's not working and you'll be able to make the changes. Thank you. I have a very last question uh, before we need to end this webinar. In case of an incident, do you need to uh, get an export permit for the disposal of waste in another, in another country? Uh, yeah, depending on the country where you are, if they, they, if they sign the Basel Convention, prevents the, the illegal export of, of uh, waste in other countries. So uh, you will have to deal with the national authorities and uh, ask them for the proper permit. Uh, the, it's the national authorities that are in charge of the uh, implementation of the conventions like that. Usually it's translated into national regulation. And, you know, if you need an export permit, then there is a process for that and there will be uh, in, uh, information as well about the uh, type of uh, marking that needs to be on the container and the type of containers and things like that. So uh, that's uh, that's usually the process. Thank you very much, Stefan, and uh, all of you for your, your, your important questions. Uh, we need to uh, end it here. Um, I warmly thank you, Stefan, for, for your high quality presentations and your renewed participation in the Jawaka Fubina series. Um, I also thank my colleague Emily, who worked with us uh, on the organization of this uh, online event. And finally, thank you all uh, for attending this webinar and engaging with us. Um, I can already tell you that the next GIAWA Cup webinar will be held by the end of uh, June um, and it will be dedicated to the use of these persons. So please stay tuned uh, to our LinkedIn page and, and our website for more information. Uh, thank you again for everyone. Uh, to everyone, I, I wish you a nice rest of the day and I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.